you're still with us, thank you. My name is Ranger Youssef, and you are still tuned in for the 10th annual Ghost Train event. Our next story by Mr. Robert Stevens is a tale which has a little bit of history mixed in with a little bit of mystery. Now, please stay tuned for There are a lot of ghosts in the Big South Fork. Not all of them are haints or spirits or ghostly apparitions that you might see in the night. Some of them are stories. And how is a story like a ghost? Because a story, especially a true story from history, is like a ghost because a ghost is supposed to be the spirit of a person that's left behind in a place or building after the person has died. And all the emotions and thoughts and fears, the angers, the love, all those things that were part of that person when they were alive and in flesh and blood have gone away and died and all that's left behind in a ghost is their spirit well stories are like that and history stories are like that the live fleshed out people who felt and dreamed and hoped have died and all that's left is a whisper a faint image of what that real person was like. We may have the witness uh, accounts. We may have uh, tales that have been told about what happened, but the real living person has gone. And so history and stories in history are really kind of ghost tales all the time. The ghost story I want to talk about today starts with a young Indian woman named Princess Corn Blossom. Now, Princess Corn Blossom was from a powerful Cherokee family. Uh, her father was named Chief Doublehead. Chief Doublehead was such a well-known and powerful Indian leader that he had attended such conferences as the council at Sycamore Shoals, where the Cherokee negotiated with men like Daniel Boone for the transfer of land north of the Cumberland River that would be given to the white settlers. And <clears throat> the Indians would have to live south of that border. Chief Doublehead, in fact, was part of a Cherokee delegation to visit General Washington in 1791. Though he was a powerful man in Cherokee politics, he sometimes would live just north of here in what is now Wayne County in a cave. And uh, they would camp and trap and hunt near there. Princess Corn Blossom had a brother named Tuckahoe. And Tuckahoe was a great warrior and hunter, just like his father. Tuckahoe and his father and his sister were at home one day when a trader came in, a white trader named Blackburn. Blackburn had a man with him named Monday. And the two of them were Blackburn in charge. Monday was his assistant. And <clears throat> they would trade various items to the natives. One of the items that Blackburn had for trade was a beautiful flintlock Kentucky rifle, or sometimes called Pennsylvania rifle, a long rifle. It was a beautiful weapon. It was, had a beautiful silver uh, patch box in the handle that you could open up and pull out a cloth patch to wrap around a lead ball to put into the 
end of the muzzle loading rifle and tamp it down with powder underneath before firing it. But that was a beautiful silver patch box on this firearm. And Tuckahoe loved the looks of that rifle. With it came a, an engraved powder horn and a braided, decorated bullet pouch as well. And Tuckahoe saw that weapon and wanted it. He knew that as a warrior and as a hunter, he could use that weapon to great effect. And it was also very beautiful. Well, Blackburn told him that he, he could have that rifle, but all he had to do was get him a little bit of silver. Blackburn was a wealthy trader. He wore fancy clothes with a giant engraved silver buckle. And <clears throat> all the Indians traded with him for things. And so there was a history of working with this man and Tuckahoe deeply wanted that firearm. So he left home to go down into the Big South Fork region in order to go where he knew he could find some silver. Because we're here at the Blue Heron, which is a coal temple, where in the 1900s, people came to dig coal out of the earth. But this is not the first mine that existed in the Big South Fork region. Before that, there was the Cherokee silver mine. Now, no one knows where it is today, but legend says that the Cherokee had a silver mine here and Doublehead and his daughter, Princess Corn Blossom, and Tuckahoe all knew the location of that silver mine. They would take silver regularly float down to what is now uh, down the Big South Fork to what is now Burnside and float down the Cumberland River all the way to the frontier fort of Nashboro in what's now Nashville and trade there with the silver that they brought from the mine. Well, Blackburn had asked for silver and Tuckahoe knew where some silver was in the mine. So Tuckahoe left his home went to the mine and began to dig for silver. He didn't know that Blackburn and Monday had followed him. And as he was hard at work in the mine, he heard someone at the mouth uh, of the mine. And he left, went and saw Blackburn and Monday on their horses. Tuckahoe was irate. This was a secret family, tribal secret. No one was supposed to know where the, one, the silver mine was, certainly not two white men. And Tuckahoe tried to get them to leave. They wouldn't listen to his arguments. The men got off their horses. They surrounded Tuckahoe, and one of them, Monday, grabbed the pick that Tuckahoe had been using to dig and that he would brought with him to the mouth of the mine and struck Tuckahoe in the head, killing him instantly. The two men wrapped Tuckahoe in a blanket, drug him off into the woods and dumped him into a rock fissure. They covered him over with some brush and rocks and left and went back to the mine to dig for silver. In the meantime, since this Princess Corn Blossom had been noticed that her brother was missing, and she went following him, thinking maybe he had gone to the silver mine, she knew that he had liked the rifle that Blackburn had for sale and knew that he might have gone there in order to get some silver. So she crept up secretly, quietly, up to the mine. And as she got closer, she saw that there were two horses there that they appeared to be Blackburn's horses. She saw 
the beautiful rifle sitting beside the mouth of the cave. And she knew what must have happened. She crept closer, closer to the mine, and she began to hear that there were men working inside and talking. She could hear their voices and knew that it was not her brother. And yet she knew she heard the voice of who she thought was Blackburn. She looked at the mouth of the cave and saw blood where her brother had been killed. And she saw drag marks into the woods and figured out what had happened. So Princess Corn Blossom grabbed the musket and ran away as fast as she could go. Well, about that time, Blackburn and Monday came out of the mine to get a drink. And as they came, they saw that the rifle was missing. They quickly looked around and saw footprints. And they saw, they heard running far away from them down the river. So Blackburn and Monday both jumped on their horses and began to run after Princess Corn Blossom. They almost caught up with her when a thunderstorm came up. The thunderstorm poured torrential rain on all of them. And the men couldn't follow the tracks any longer. Princess Corn Blossom went into the woods, off the trail, above the river, and found a chestnut tree to stay under for the night. During the night, Princess Corn Blossom heard someone walking below her on the trail. And she gave a warning signal from her tribe. And she was responded to by what turned out to be two warriors from her family, from her tribe. They came to her and she told them what had happened. And they discussed what needed to happen the next morning. They could hear Blackburn and Monday not too far away in their camp and knew that something had to happen the next day. Princess Corn Blossom, when the morning rose, sat and went to the far side of the river across a bridge or across a ford at what today is Yamacraw Bridge. And she crossed over, sat on the far side of the river, and waited with the two warriors in ambush for Blackburn and Monday. She knew that they would come looking for her, and so she waited in what in the 1800s was called bushwhacking, and in other what we would today call sniping. And she waited to see when they would appear. Blackburn and Monday came to the edge of the ford and stopped. Blackburn got off his horse and began to cross the river. As he did, Princess Corn Blossom took that beautiful rifle with the silver inlaid patch box. She opened the patch box, pulled out a piece of cloth, poured some of the gunpowder into the rifle from that engraved um, powder horn that her brother had wanted so much. She wrapped the ball in that and tamped it down into the rifle. She then raised it carefully and pointed it at Blackburn's chest. And as he began to cross the river, she pulled the trigger slowly and whispered, Yamacraw. Yamacraw. She pulled the trigger. There was a snap, bang, and the bullet raced from the, bullet, from the firearm into Blackburn's chest and killed him instantly. He fell into the water and floated away. Well, Monday saw this, and Monday began to run. That's when the two other warriors took off, and they found him and executed him as well. Now, all stories from history are hard to flesh out and see the intent of the people involved. And we don't know 
100% what was going through Princess Corn Blossom's mind when she pulled that trigger and killed Blackburn? Was she acting in self-defense because she knew Blackburn would come for her, would come for her family, because it was their mine? And if they were going to, Blackburn and Monday were going to keep access to the mine, they'd have to kill the other people who knew where it were. So maybe she was acting in self-defense. Maybe she was acting in revenge for her brother who had been killed. These were lawless times and there was no court or police to go to for aid. We may never know. So this ghost story, we have to piece together from what happened and what we've been told over the years. Where did this happen? We don't know exactly. It was here on the Big South Fork. It was somewhere along this river that stretches from Tennessee up into Kentucky. But there is a place where you can cross the river, a place where today you could still uh, hike, camp, and maybe at night you might come upon some of those spirits, some of those wandering souls left behind after their own dark deeds left them here on earth. You may meet Blackburn and Monday at midnight walking through the woods. And if you do, remember the words that Princess Corn Blossom said as she removed Blackburn from the earth. Because in the 1800s, the word Yamacraw meant a worthless person, a scoundrel, a rogue. So if you see the shades of Monday or Blackburn as you hike along the Big South Fork, you look at them and you say, Yamacraw, Yamacraw. I believe they'll take off running. Thank you. Thank you.